at last year's annual auction, there was an auction item entitled Select a, to a Sermon Topic, and Michael Snyder bought it. Now the caveat is that I had to agree <laughs> on what that topic could be, but it was a no-brainer, no-brainer whatsoever when he came to me and said I would like the topic to be about duty, the kind of duty that's fun, the kind of duty that's easy, the kind of duty that's natural, not that other kind of duty. And I knew what he meant when he said that other kind of duty, because I was married to a military man for 27 years. Wow. And I know what duty's all about. Duty's about being responsible for the safety and the security of our country. The both personnel, uh, enlisted personnel and officers would take turns with a watch of duty. It usually lasted 24 hours, but the implication that it had for us, especially on holidays and weekends, was that he had to carry a pager. He always had to be near a telephone, and that was back in the day when all telephones had cords. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't engage in any activities that might impair his judgment, because he had to be able to make clear decisions, and he had to really not be that far away from the base. So everybody dreaded having duty, because it was mandatory. It was an obligation. It was something that you had to do. It was something that you didn't have a choice about. And that's the kind of duty that gives the true meaning of the word a bad rap. Mm -hmm. I went to the dictionary, and that meaning gives the true meaning of the word a bad rap, too. Mm -hmm. I was really upset. <laughs> the dictionary's definition gives the word's true meaning a bad rap because it speaks of a moral or legal obligation a task or an action that someone is required to perform. And to me, requirements mean rules, and rules are meant to be broken. Yes, ha ha ha, just kidding. <laughs> There's a big difference between rules and laws, especially spiritual law. Spiritual law is immutable, which means it's unchangeable. It's rock solid. It is always there. It always works. It never wavers. But rules, rules are agreements that we make up as a society. We have rules for justice. We have rules for safety. We have rules for, well, for whatever reason we have rules for. But we have rules that really help us. Like we have a rule that you can't cut in line because that's not fair. And then we have rules that we want to give so much credence to, we turn them into ordinances, or we call them laws. It's against the law to run a red light. It's against the law to burgle someone else's home. There are laws that we can change. It takes some doing, but we can change laws that we agree to collectively. For instance, it used to be against the law to purchase alcoholic beverages. Well, we repealed that law. And in some states, you can purchase marijuana. In other states, you cannot purchase marijuana. And all of that is being renegotiated because it's really something that we have made up. We've just made up those rules. If we go back to our Judaic tradition, our Judaic roots, there are 613 commandments. Commandments are the holy word for rules. There are 200 and something, something like 48, 248 rules that are stated, or commandments that are stated in the positive sense. No God. And when I say no God, I mean the K-N-O-W. No God. Emulate his ways. Listen to prophets who speak in his name. The other 365 commandments are stated in the negative sense. Do not use God's name in vain. Do not oppress others. Do not gossip about others. They are, they are rules that have come out of discernment, that have come out to help give our society and our culture structure. Because structure helps us be safe. Structure helps us be orderly or order orderly. <laughs> Structure, structure actually supports us. So structure from a rule or structure from law gives us a foundation upon which 
to stand. He gives us support. And we need that support as we have that outward expression of spirit. Because it, the support actually gives us freedom to live in righteousness. It gives us freedom to live in the flow. It gives us freedom to live in harmony. In unity, we teach that that inner wisdom, that inner guidance, that inner splendor, that inner beingness flows from the outside in. So if we ever need to make a decision, which we have to make all the time in this sea of infinite possibility, it's really good to have structure when you're in a sea of infinite possibility because anything is possible. So we, the guidance that we need and the wisdom that we need in order to discern whether what we're feeling is an expression of the divine, what we're believing is in alignment with the divine or in harmony with in harmony with divine principle or spiritual law, we turn within because we in unity recognize that our highest wisdom is within us. We go inward for guidance. If we get the same guidance enough, we develop guidelines. With guidelines, we develop rules. So you see how it starts from the inside out, from that inner splendor, that inner wisdom, that inner beingness that we are. Robert Browning, the great poet, called it the inner splendor. And he says this, There is an inmost center in us all where truth abides in fullness. And to know rather consists in opening out a way where the imprisoned splendor may escape than effecting entry for a light supposed to be without. And what he's really talking about is that illusion that we have that we have to do something to let the God out there shine light in here. So it is a misperception that God is only out there and that there is no God in here. The truth is that we have the entirety of God within us and it is our duty to let God out. To let that inner splendor escape. To find an opening. To let God come out. And you noticed I used the word duty. Here's my working definition of duty. It's engaging in an activity for the highest benefit of self and of humankind. We have a natural, it is our natural spiritual inclination to want the highest and best for ourselves, to have the most joy, the most peace, the most love. It is our natural spiritual way of being to want that same highest and best for people we meet, for people we know, for people we don't even know. And it can come out of us like this. We are engaged in our duty joyfully without overthinking because what we're really doing is allowing it to come from the inside out. There's a story told in the Christian scriptures in the book of Luke, a parable called the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is told in many Christian communities. It's very familiar to a lot of people. A man was walking down the road. He was attacked by robbers. He was beaten and left for dead priest came by and looked at him and went, eh, and he walked on. A Levite came by and looked at him and said, Ugh, and he walked on by. But a Samaritan came by, came right over to the man, tended to his wounds, got him up on his donkey, and took him to the inn. And I don't know why I had to retell you the story, but I said, for some reason, I had to retell you the whole story. <laughs> but that's basically it. Now, in Unity, we look at stories metaphysically. So we want to know the metaphysics of each part of the story because each part of the story, even the characters, are aspects of ourselves. So the priest and the Levite represent forms of religious thoughts that follow 
set rule of the law with little or no thought to its practical use or spiritual importance. In other words, the priests and the Levites are so attached to the law that they look to the law without any regards of what is going on in a situation. They are outward focused. They are looking to that outward God to tell them what to do. Whereas the Samaritan, he has traits that make religion a living, spiritual, and uplifting power. That's so in alignment with unity because we believe that unity is a way of life. We don't look out there for rules. Unity is full of rebels. Which is good news, and it's like the other really good news. We look within for our wisdom. What is our inner spiritual impulse telling us to do? Our inner spiritual impulse is telling us that it's our duty to be with one another. It's our duty to make that connection. It's easy. It's pleasurable. In fact, the payoffs are enormous. You'll talk to somebody and you'll hear a story about how they had to take care of their parent. They had to take care of their mother. They had to take care of their brother or whoever they had to take care of because it was their duty. And when all was said and done, they'll turn around and say, it was the best thing I ever did. It taught me the greatest lessons in life. I thought it was a burden going into it. And I found that it was a blessing coming out of it. From the inside out, our duty is a blessing. It's easy. It's even fun. And it feels so good to support and be with other people. The prophet Isaiah said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release the prisoners. Remember, we're every aspect of the story. So it is our negative thinking that is oppressing us. It is our attachment to deception that is leading us to brokenheartedness. It is our captivity to the appearance of lack that is leading us to poverty. And it is our imprisonment, our thoughts and our attitudes and beliefs that imprison our minds that once we choose to think a different thought, we're released and we are free to like let it rip, let that inside goodness rip, let it overflow, let, it, let you be the wine, the balm to support someone else on their journey. And like I said, it can take a long time for this realization to come to you, or it can happen like this. But whenever you have your spiritual awakening, that's when you recognize that you are anointed. Anointed merely means that you have tuned into the consciousness of your being, the truth of who you are at your very core. Being anointed, anytime you see Lord, and particularly in the Hebrew scriptures, you can substitute the word law. So the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, not somebody telling you you have to do it, but the spirit of the law is moving you from the inside out to take action. That's when you're enlightened. That's when you're anointed. That's when you're awakened. That's where you're in the words of the Urban Dictionary are woke. <laughs> I don't know how familiar you are with the Urban Dictionary, but they have all kinds of words that are used differently than I've ever heard them used before. And maybe not in what we would consider proper English. So sorry, Mrs. Anderson. <laughs> no, there are words that make sense in our everyday vernacular. So when we are woke, it's like we've been sleeping for a long time. And all of a sudden, we can see clearly. And we can see clearly current events that we were just going along with, that we're not going to go along with anymore. When we get woke, we see activities and behaviors that we have been engaging in that we were completely unconscious about. Racism. 
So many times it's like, I'm not racist, but whoa, I do something and then I woke. And I go, I am not going to do that anymore. I'm going to change my attitudes and beliefs. I'm going to woke myself so that my duty to myself and my fellow human being can flow freely, can be in harmony. I'm going to tell you two stories. One, the first one, it took place in 1981 in Los Angeles, California, where on the ninth floor of an office building on Wilshire Avenue, there was a young man who walked out on that ledge right near the fire escape, and he was threatening to jump. Now, for hours, police officers, a psychologist, a chaplain, had been trying to lean out of the window to talk to him. And every time they got beyond just their shoulders coming out of their that window, the young man would begin to dangle his legs and say his life is over and he wanted to jump. Now, one of the observers of all of this event going on called his best friend on the telephone. Back in the day, when telephone had wires, he called his friend on the telephone and he said, you've got to come down here and take a look and see if you can do anything about this. Well, his best friend happened to be Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, four minutes later, arrives coming down the wrong side of the street, lights blinking in his Rolls Royce car. He jumps out. He's in a three-piece suit. I mean, he's dressed immaculately. He gets up there, and he begs for the opportunity to talk to this young man. Now, here's what he said, and there he is hanging out in the window just beyond his shoulders. He says, you're my, my brother. I love you, and I couldn't lie to you. And that simple phrase began a conversation. So eventually, Ali went from where you see him there on the left, around the column and into the middle niche, and then around that next column, nine stories up, to where he could be with that young man, get his arms around him, help him back into the building, down into his car where he drove him to first to the police station, and then to the VA hospital. Wow. When he was interviewed later, he said, I, I didn't feel like a hero. I didn't even think about what I was doing. I just knew it was my duty to be with him in that moment. In 2015, a 16-year-old boy named Jamie was living in Dublin, Ireland. He probably still lives in Dublin, Ireland. He, was, he made a decision to go to the candy store. He felt like he wanted to treat himself to some candy, so he was walking between his house and the candy store, and in order to get to the candy store, he had to walk across the River Liffey. And there was a bridge there, and on that bridge, he saw an older man, and those were his words, in his 30s. <laughs> he saw the older man on the outside of the bridge. And this is, when he passed by, this is what he said. I stopped and asked him if he was okay, but I knew from the look in his eyes that he wasn't. I saw tears coming from his eyes. And so Jamie began to talk to him and eventually got him to come and sit on the steps at the edge of the, the, the end of the bridge. And they talked for 45 minutes. After which time Jamie said, I'm probably in a lot of trouble by now. My mom just thought I was going to the candy store. But before I go, let me call you an ambulance. And the man said, no, 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 I don't want an ambulance. I probably just need to walk around. And Jamie was like, no, really, I'm going to call you an ambulance. And as the ambulance came and the man, the older man, got in the ambulance, they exchanged cell phone numbers. Jamie said, I just want to know that you're okay. Well, Jamie didn't hear from the man for three months. And three months later, the man called him up and he said, I want to let you know that my wife and I are expecting a baby. And we're going to name the baby after you. Thank you so much. You were there for me in my hour of need. And then when the BBC came in and interviewed Jamie, Jamie said, I didn't feel like a hero. I did what a thousand other people could have done that day. I simply asked him if he was okay. It was my duty to be with him until he was. Now today I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because in the aftermath of Hurricane Florence, many of us have done our duty. 
and we've done it easily and effortlessly, and we've done it without thinking. We've done many of the things that Reverend Nikki mentioned in the opening. We've loaned somebody a generator. We've gone and solicited water for rescue workers. We've organized a campaign, or we've contributed to a campaign giving clothing, even new from the store. If finding shirts on sale for $5.99, I'll take 10, please or I'll take 20, because somebody has just had an experience where they need new clothes, and children need new toys. Every one of us has helped and supported Wilmington and the greater Wilmington, North Carolina area come back to restoration, to find our new normal. It's not the same normal. The same normal is a setting on a dryer, and it only works for dryers. <laughs> <laughs> but our community has a new normal because we've been engaged in doing our duty, the kind of duty that's fun, that's easy, that's called stewardship, that comes from the inside. Nobody has had to tell us to share our food. Nobody has had to tell us to give the man down the street our extra gas. Nobody's had to tell us to do that from the outside. We've known it from the inside. And I can't tell you how awed and proud I am of you as individuals for wanting the best for yourself and the best for all of humankind. You've done it by opening your hearts by releasing your inner splendor. So let's sing our way into meditation, knowing that we are overflow. <laughs> In all the beautiful ways that we are. Let's open our hearts. <laughs> 